If we fail, we are going to be used as an argument against cleaning up the yeah. ocean because you it's see, like it's, it's, it can't be done. Exactly. Hello, good evening everybody. My name is Marcia Luyten, I'm a journalist and I'm happy to guide you through this evening. An evening in which we will dive into the oceans, into the rivers, because um, every year a few million tons of plastic waste get into those open waters. Tonight we will talk about what is needed to cleanse these waters of all that plastic pollution. And what should governments or companies or we as consumers do in order to permanently solve this problem? But first we will start with Boyan Slats. Because Boyan, as an 18-year-old boy, he became world famous with a TED talk in which he launched his idea of cleaning up that mass, huh? of, of making a huge floating barrier that could clean up the world's plastics. His company, The Ocean Cleanup, is now 10 years old, still operating. Boyan is here. Please give him a warm welcome. Um, I think it's already 11 years ago that you started huh, with um, the ocean cleanup. Um, you made a first design to, to clean all the, the plastics from the oceans. That was like a huge floating barrier that would like suck in and collect all the plastics. This yeah. is the first one, no? That was the, the artist impression. Artist impression, yes. Yeah. You never stopped developing. And recently you published or showed your newest design, the O3. So I was wondering, um, what to you is the most exciting thing about System 03? We've now had okay. um, this new system in operation for about 12 weeks. Uh, now we have a, a, a brief winter period, so we're, we're idle now. But next year, the goal is to, yeah, to really get the performance to where we want it to be. And with that, we estimate that if you then deploy 10 of those, you can clean up the patch in 10 years. But at the same time, you know, the plastic getting into the oceans just keeps going on. Huh? So um, do you feel uh, the problem has gotten smaller because you're now being more and more effective? Or is it getting bigger because the inflow doesn't stop? At the current rate, the inflow is still bigger than the, um, the speed we're removing it. So yeah, at nominal performance, you need about two systems to outweigh the arrival of new plastic to uh, to the garbage patch. So yeah. we're not yet at that point. So you know, in the ocean, it's really about developing the um, the technology. Uh, once it's fully mature, which we want to get to next year, um, you know, then it's it, we think it's the right moment to start scaling up to uh, to a fleet of systems. Yeah. After you started with this, uh, many quite some research has been done, because huh? the plastic all of a sudden also became a topic everywhere. Researchers discovered, for example, that it's more effective to clean up the rivers upstream, because 1% of the rivers accounts for 80% of the plastic pollution. Did these results really change your approach? Yeah, so, so that was actually um, our, our research. So when we... Um, um, so I, I think it's one of the things I'm most proud of in terms of what we achieved over the past 10 years. It's, of course, we've, you know, we have the tools now. Um, we've intercepted in rivers also millions of, of, of kilos of, of, of plastic, preventing that from flowing into so the ocean. working now also in rivers. Right. Back in 2017, we were the first to map where the plastic is coming from, where it's leaking into yeah. the ocean. And indeed, we found that um, yeah, just 1% of rivers do about 80% of the emission. Stopping the inflow is very important. We must prevent more stuff from going into the ocean, but it's not a replacement for no. dealing with the pollution for which essentially the prevention comes too late. Like if, if I could choose, I'd much rather catch you know, a bottle in a river than in the middle of the ocean. Uh, but of course, it's essentially 60 years too late for that, right? So we, if we really want to get back to clean oceans, we also have to clean up the legacy pollution. At the same time, if we only do that, then we can never stop, right? So we also need to do the inflow. That, so that's why you know, this two-pronged approach tackling it in reverse, cleaning up the legacy, you know, that's really what we're about. So it's not your focus has not really shifted, but you're into a two-front approach now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What is like the major challenge you're facing now? Yeah, uh, so it's not a question anymore about of, of feasibility, right? We know we can do this, oh. the tools exist. Uh, now it's about 
preparing ourselves for scale up. And that means that we, you know, in rivers, we want to complete our first 20 rivers. Um, those are projects that are ongoing now, but there are still um, you know, various improvements we can make with some. Some of them are still in the process of being deployed. So to, to have this solid foundation, again, to demonstrate we can do it, to um, you know, we still occasionally make mistakes uh, where there's you know, technical issues, um, you know, permitting processes that take a long time, things like that. Um, and we already have our hands full dealing with those things for 20 rivers. So we, when we go to the next batch of you know, about 100 rivers, uh, we don't want to you know, kill ourselves with all these issues, right? So we want to, you know, to be disciplined first, really finish those 20 before taking the scale-up step. But there's also some political hurdles you've got to take always. There's just a lot of um, bureaucracy. People are not used to this, uh, so it's something new. So they have to kind of figure it out from scratch how you do this. So for example, now uh, we're in the process of deploying in the most polluted river in Indonesia. And uh, there are 11 different authorities involved there. Oh. So uh, you can imagine, you sometimes have to, you have meetings yeah. with 50 people. You know, those are not very effective meetings if you have 50 people. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that takes... So, th so with oceans, I think it's still mostly you know, a technical challenge and primarily how do we uh, get better and better at targeting those hotspots. So it's yeah. training the algorithm, making the software better. Um, so it's more technical. With rivers, it's much more about um, the system around the system. So how do we um, you know, scale that effectively so that we don't kill ourselves in, in complexity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's move to the audience. What happens with all the plastic that you collect and how easy is it to kind of find recycling infrastructure and facilities around? So when it comes to the, the plastic we take out of the, the garbage patch, um, we have set up uh, a supply chain to to fully recycle that. So, uh, because we think there's actually still value in that material, we call it our gold. Essentially, it's like a very special material. It has a story attached to it. Um, so, also in part of uh, trying to find the revenue models to to make this this scale, uh, we are now partnering with with companies to to bring that uh, material into durable, sustainable products. Uh, so Kia, the car company, is sort of the first one where we're now um, working with them to bring some of our material into parts for their EVs. Um, with rivers, it's more complicated because, of course, these are spread out all over the world. We're in eight countries. Um, there is no infrastructure. The, the stuff we take out is total garbage. It's everything from literal cadavers <laughs> to uh, diapers to, of course, a lot of mixed plastic. Um, so there you're much more reliant on, on the local waste infrastructure. But what we also, you know, what is you know, part of our ethos is to make sure that that waste never ends up back into the environment. So we, you know, we audit the, you know, the, the chain of the, the waste there as well. Usually, you know, the minimum is a, is a landfill. In some places like Vietnam, there's actually a waste to energy plant. Uh, and in some places like uh, Los Angeles, where we also have an interceptor, uh, Jamaica, and now soon in, in Malaysia, uh, part of the waste is also uh, sorted and, and recycled. So to, again, do the best thing we can do with the, the material that's, uh, that's taken out. Okay, yeah. thank you. And we wish you Pleasure. all the luck with cleaning up our oceans. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, so we will continue the conversation with Joao Fibari Birawi, who's the Director of Public Affairs at the Ocean Cleanup, and with Irina Buga, she's Senior Associate at De Brau, that's the law firm that is the Ocean Cleanup's pro bono partner. Irina, um, from a legal perspective, huh, um, why is it interesting for De Brau to work with the Ocean Cleanup? Well, aside, I think, from the environmental impact of the work, which is obvious, um, the work that we have had to do for the ocean cleanup is uh, incredibly innovative. And it requires a lot of out of the box thinking, a lot of holistic thinking, um, because the novel nature of what the ocean cleanup does uh, triggers novel legal questions. Because they operate at the high seas and there's no jurisdiction on that. It, I mean, it's nobody's water. Can you say then that there are absolutely no re legal rules on the high seas? 
So uh, adding to your point, it's not only the tech innovation, it's the legal innovation. There's a lot of legal innovation in what we do. And, and take what I'm going to say now half jokingly, but the same thing that gave the Netherlands the golden age gave us plastic in the ocean. And so mm -hmm. it was precisely because in the 17th century, there was a legal dispute between Leiden and, and some academics from Spain and Portugal. Hugo de Groot, no? Yes. Ah. And uh, that created this idea that the sea belonged to everyone. When it belongs to everyone, it doesn't belong to anyone. And it took until the 90s to have a treaty, the law of the sea, uh, to enter into force to start having more stewardship about the high seas. Mm. Even now, for example, we have that treaty, the law of the sea, but even the United States has not ratified that treaty. Oh. So that, that shows how the, the big powers, like the Netherlands in the past, still prefer open seas mm. because the power will govern over the open seas. Of course, this is changing radically. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, by the way, the, the, the treaty, the law of the sea, came into force a couple of years before Boyan was born. And so Boy, uh, Boyan is now starting this uh, new era of stewardship, where we have also the BBNJ, which is the High Seas Treaty. And now we have the Plastics Treaty coming soon enough. All of this is creating rules, uh, the obligations by states to care, to have a duty of care in relation to the high seas. And hopefully with time, that creates the political and legal incentives uh, for the ocean cleanup to have more support in cleaning up the ocean. So Irina already said, um, uh it being nobody's water um, doesn't mean that, you, that there are no legal implications. Can you just give an example of a thing that you wanted to do as the ocean cleanup that you just couldn't because of legal restrictions? Well, I usually say that we submitted ourselves to the rule of law through this agreement that we signed with the Netherlands, the Covenant, yeah. under which we have reporting obligations, under which, of course, we help the Netherlands to comply with its duty of care with the high seas. Uh, where we have reporting obligations in relation to yeah. bycatch, environmental impact, to do assessments. None of that was mandatory. We didn't have to do any of that. But you said it wasn't mandatory, but because of this custom agreement with the Dutch uh, government, um, you could also carry the Dutch flag. I mean, one of the things that this covenant does um, is that, and I'll name a few other crucial points um, in a moment, but one of them is to, uh, to confirm the relationship with and the role of the Netherlands in relation to the ocean cleanups activities. To put it in simple terms, the Netherlands plays, uh, in a sense, a role of that's analogous to a flag state. It's not the flag state because the ocean cleanup under international law has not been formally qualified as a ship. Mm. But what's interesting, and it ties into another sort of key point under that covenant, which is that it clarifies um, the status under international law of these novel systems because um, there is no made-to-measure legal framework that exists for these ocean systems. Um, and it does that by uh, combining the rules uh, on so-called marine scientific research under this constitution for the oceans, the Law oh. of the Sea Convention, by analogy, in combination with uh, the crucial sort of principles or rules from the legislation that applies to ships under international yeah. law. But all of that is applied by analogy for a different sort of pragmatic, legal, yeah. and sort of creative reasons um, in order to, that's the creative sort of holistic approach that we were talking about earlier, to maximize compliance with potentially applicable international rules given that there is no... Um, ready-made legal, legal framework. Legal framework. Because none of the rules were, were drafted thinking that someone will go to the middle of the ocean with a system to catch plastic. So yeah. it doesn't fall under any of the existing yeah. categories. You already mentioned the UN uh, treaty. What is this treaty about? What, what difference would it make? Yeah, so it's the, the so-called UN Global Plastics Treaty, and the ocean cleanup has uh, observer status within the, the UN, so we can go to these meetings and contribute, sharing our research, our data. It's important also to share that when we catch plastic, we are also gathering data. We are understanding better the type of plastic, the mm -hmm. quantities, all of that. It's very much valuable data to inform policymakers. So this treaty is being negotiated. Uh, but it's expected to be finalized by the end of next year maybe early 25 
countries are very committed to it. It's supposed to address plastic pollution in the environment from upstream, from production to waste management. But also we expect, and we are working very hard with several governments, to have an international legal obligation to clean plastic in the ocean in areas beyond national yeah. jurisdiction. So we would have a treaty with an obligation. Oh. That means that then states that join that treaty will have that oh. legal obligation. You sound quite optimistic, I must say. But usually, if, if a treaty comes with obligations, many countries do not want to ratify. From my point of view, of course, I always see treaty negotiations as a, as a process and as a catalyst. We also work as a catalyst. We see already many countries uh, uh, adopting measures in relation to plastic pollution. Of course, with a treaty, with hard commitments, uh, change will come faster. But I'm very optimistic that the, the negotiation of the treaty in itself will accelerate many changes already. Uh -huh. yeah. I would like to invite Maria Vestobos now to join us in the conversation. Maria is the founder and CEO of the Plastic Soup Foundation, so that is another organization working on the same trouble. Because um, the Plastic Soup Foundation is an environmental nonprofit dedicated to reducing plastic pollution. Maria, welcome. Hi. What I miss in the discussion, if I hear you about Global Plastic Treaty in Nairobi, where I was too, but we never met before, is that you're not talking about um, the obligation to produce less plastic. Mm. At this moment, we are producing. Now, 2022, I'm looking at Jeroen, uh, we produced 500 million tons plastic in a year, which have, of which we throw away 40%, which is over 240 million tons, billion kilos, that is. And that's single-use plastic. That's what we throw away immediately. And that's if you compare it, and it's oil-based. So, um, and uh, um, the planet cannot live with it anymore. It's we are. It's the tenth boundary. We are. We went far too far. We talked about it. You agree with, uh, about that? And we are working on uh, on uh, stopping uh, closing the tap. We want it to become less. Uh -huh. We are completely focusing on the health of the planet and health of human life uh -huh. and uh, animal life. Is that realistic, Joao? Well, the, the, the treaty is really comprehensive, so it covers uh, upstream production caps, banning of certain problematic plastics. It also includes midstream waste management, circularity, um, and so it's a very comprehensive treaty oh. through that will cover the whole cycle uh, of plastic. So I think there are reasons to be optimistic. Of course, uh, there are there is no such thing as a a perfect treaty. If the treaty is too perfect, nobody will ratify it because it will be merely aspirational. Uh -huh. And there is a, something relatively different uh, in this treaty, by the way. For the first time in a, in a global issue like this, the divide is not really global north and global south because the major producers of plastic are actually middle-income countries. And they have huge industries producing plastic, and so there's a lot of economic dependencies. And it complexifies much more the discussion. Production is spread through Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and of course in the US, so that you have uh, this, this data point. So the, the second largest industry in value in the US is the chemistry industry, where plastic production is, is included also. And of course, the consuming uh, consumer brands that also have production throughout uh, the world. But there is an, a conversation to ban problematic plastics. Uh, I'm still optimistic that we will get something out of it. Uh, but again, the, 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 the treaty is much more comprehensive than that. It includes also issues of waste management, waste trade, just transition. There are many societies around the world with waste pickers. Uh, and so if you solve plastic pollution, waste pickers will lose their livelihood. So the treaty also discusses just transition for these communities. So it's, it's a very comprehensive treaty. Are you optimistic about the treaty, Maria? Well, n I'm not so much because we have an, uh, uh, an alliance of over 60 countries countries who are high ambition coalition who is very who is very willing to work hard on reduction and uh, eliminating but for example the 16000 dangerous chemical cocktails that go into plastic because plastic is not only an inert substance if you start counting what the health consequences are of these plastics and i can tell you it's in the raindrops it's in the clouds it's in the in our crops it's in our oh. apples it's in 
everything. It's in our clothes. It's everywhere. Oh. If you start calculating the health consequences of all these plastics, then you will see that it costs more than we pr profit from it. And we are talking now with sustainable investors in and outside of Holland who are um, who start to understand that they are accountable for all this health damage oh. and that they need to put their money somewhere else. Yeah, if since... you put your money only in oil and plastic, and those are two um, ways of industry that are working very closely together, you cannot keep on doing that. It's impossible if you want to preserve and save the children of next generations and the children living now, we have to act. Irina, if you listen to Maria, do you see like legal opportunities and possibilities or do you see uh, obstacles and, and hurdles? When it comes to the Global Plastics Treaty, uh, I, I definitely see ambition, let me put it this way. Um, I think the Global Plastics Treaty generally has been compared to, I mean, if successful, it will be the most important multilateral environmental agreement since the Paris Agreement, right? And it goes with the current trend that Joao also mentioned earlier, not to sound too optimistic, but, uh, you know, of the high seas definitely having a moment after the biodiversity um, uh, beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty concluded earlier this year and now this. Um, so, and, and, and I mean, the, the negotiation timing and, and planning is extremely ambitious. I am optimistic when it comes to at least certain issues, getting both more attention uh, non-legally, um, but hopefully also um, reaching some form of collective solutions and more concrete obligations being laid down uh, to combat plastic pollution than what we have now. Because, I mean, the, the reason why we are here today is because from a legal standpoint, what we have are clear, in my opinion, obligations about what needs to happen. Also with regard to, from prevention to remediation of plastic pollution, um, but not so much concrete and collective solutions to actually put them into practice. What you usually hear is if you try to tackle a problem like this, that um, pricing the costs, huh, all the external costs, like Maria just said, the costs are enormous. And then if you look at biodegradable plastics, huh, if you call them plastics, um, they are um, so much more expensive still, so industry doesn't want to use them. So isn't there um, a movement going on of pricing plastics so much more to, to incorporate the external costs? Yes, but a lot of the discussions in the treaty is precisely to create the economic incentives exactly. that makes uh, recycling more affordable, that makes alternative uh, uh, materials more uh, more viable economically. All of that needs economic, fiscal, legal, political incentives. Uh, we are not there yet, but work like like uh, the plastic soup. Foundation is doing is super important, uh, also from a legal point of view, because we still lack a lot of evidence and more research on these matters. The fact that the, the foundation is creating so much research and data uh, about the impact on health, by the way, that has legal implications because uh, that can uh, fuel this idea of the precautionary principle, uh, which is very common in relation to environmental protection, but that can be very relevant in, in relation to human health. Yeah. And so we for, really don't know, the, yeah, of course. Yeah, if I may, for example, biodegradability, we did a study with Wageningen University about biodegradable mulch mm -hmm. on, uh, on, uh, on, our, uh, on our agriculture grounds. And uh, it seemed it was not biodegrading at all. And that became a big mess and uh, a lot of trouble in the publicity. Because the thing is that the biodegradability of these mulch are tested in labs and not tested in on the earth. So the, the, you need to be more transparent about it. And you need to test it in real life and not only in a lab. And we have much more research like that we need. Absolutely, that. and it's super important. I also want to add one point to this discussion because this is first world discussion. Uh, but uh, it's, we need to be a little bit more pragmatic when we go to certain countries that are growing very fast with a rising number of uh, rising populations, yeah. with very challenging waste management uh, uh, systems, with uh, consuming uh, schemes uh, that 
that have to rely on plastic sometimes to transport food in safety to certain countries there's no technical alternative so I always like to balance this, yes, but let's not ignore also that there are very objective uh, reasons for certain countries to have trouble dealing with uh, alternative materials or with wa bad waste management. There's also such a thing as greenwashing. Huh? And some people, and I've also heard Maria uh, s saying that somewhere else, um, how that you incorporate co uh, corporations working together, um, fully supporting the clean-up solutions, but that, that they're not producing their own uh, production or uh, the emission of plastics. One such company is Coca-Cola, and you're working together with Coca-Cola. How do you look at that, at that matter? So the treaty will also discuss these matters, namely the, the extended producer responsibility, having clear rules on, on how these things need to be um, uh, addressed. But, but now also to you, how, how do you evaluate such... Well, first of all, we uh, welcome that Coke realizes its responsibility in relation to the problem and wants to join those that are trying to solve a part of the problem. Uh -huh. And that should never be criticized. Uh, and so in that sense, it's positive that they acknowledge their responsibility in relation to the problem. Okay, okay, taken. But you say that shouldn't be criticized, but also not when they're polluting a lot and do not stop that process. Absolutely, but at the same time, we are the ones that are making that data visible. We are the ones that, by intercepting, allow people to count the number of Coke bottles. So remediation is also uh, accountability, in a sense. By intercepting and showing how much leakage there is and the type of plastic that is flowing, we are introducing these data points that will bring accountability to those that are polluting, to those that are producing plastic that is not well managed. So all of this works as a catalyst for change, including in companies like, uh, like Coke. Maria, do you cooperate or is there like room for a cooperation between your two organizations? No, Boyan and I, years ago, we already said, I said, I will stand on the top of a mountain and say, I stop it here and I will, let's work together when you come to the rivers. So now he's working in the rivers, so maybe we should have a talk again. Uh -huh. But all these years when he was on the ocean, I waved from him on the <laughs> <laughs> from a mountain. I think all these projects reinforce each other. They work as catalysts for to have more support. Mm -hmm. to, to have, more have a lot of respect. And so uh, the more projects there are across the whole uh, life cycle of plastic pollution, uh, the better for everyone. Yeah. Let me see if there are questions in the audience. <laughs> Thank you for laying out what seems like a very thought through and proven vision for solving this problem. And Maria, excuse me for a moment. Let's think optimistically that you know, 10 years from now, the oceans are clean. This treaty has passed. It's the you know, panacea that it's meant to be. It, it solves a lot of these problems. Focus on the stage. And, and Bojan, what is the, the next problem that you would focus and, and turn your attention to? <laughs> Air pollution, right? Air quality. Maybe, yeah, boy, oh, there's a... Um, yeah, I mean, it's not a shortage of uh, ideas, I suppose. Um, but yeah, what a tree up. I think, you know, in general, I think there's a lot of um, pessimism about the future these days, um, especially in our generation. Um, you know, there's, people are afraid of the future rather than being excited about it. Um, I think there's even people in our generation that don't want to have kids anymore. I mean, if they can, of course. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, because they they think you know the the, the planet's going to die, and you know it's, it's um, there's no hope. So you know what I really hope is beyond, of course, that we solve you know the issue of plastic pollution in the ocean. That by by doing this, we can you know, inspire people to, to realize that, you know, problems are there to be solved. And, you know, you solve problems, um, you know, not just by pointing at the problem, by, you know, having fights on Twitter or, or whatever, um, but by doing the things that humanity is uniquely great at, right? It's by um, organizing ourselves effectively to, to do something, uh, by 
developing things that don't exist yet. I think, you know, what I hope is that the Ocean Clip can can be, um, you know, a recipe for that that can also be applied to to other problems in the future. So, um, you know, I think it's important that humanity is, um, you know, uh, optimistic because, you know, I think. Pessimism is what sort of preserves the, the status quo, and you know, optimism is what what moves us forward. Is what gives people the the, the drive to do things, right? So, um, yeah. So that's what we hope to do. So. Thank you. Thank you to all our guests tonight. I, I thought it was a very inspiring and very clarifying uh, discussion as well. Thank you to our audience at home. Thank you here. And uh, we hope to see you soon again here in the Bali. Thank you.